Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this planet. We've got another edition of Wowza Live. Uh, Ned, take it, take over. My name is Ned Dennison. I'm going to be your host. I am a uh, two-time ice miler. I'm a marathon swimmer, and I'm currently the chairman of the International Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame. And I'll turn over to our guest. His introduction should be at least five times longer than mine. So, Matt, you take us through some of your marathons, some of your cold water swimming, and some of the organization work you do. So, um, and that, I don't think my introduction will be five times longer than yours. I don't think anybody's will be longer than yours. Uh, so, <laughs> I'm not an ice miler. I think the closest I ever came to ice mile was uh, 0.9 Celsius. I was 1400 meters. Uh, so, but then since then I've done some swims, but I haven't uh, officially recorded it as an ice mile. Uh, but we have enjoyed swimming uh, in below five Celsius, and now we've reached a, a point where, hey, I think it's more fun to watch people doing ice mile. So that's the stage we have reached. And uh, my swimming uh, list, swimming achievements are not too many. Actually, I've done uh, uh, the English Channel. I've swum across uh, Lake Ontario. Uh, I've done a lot of swims in San Francisco Bay. Uh, that's where my open water swimming uh, kicked off. Um, and I've uh, swum across Straits of Magellan. Those are the main uh, uh, like iconic swims uh, that I've uh, done. But I've, I have a lot of memories like uh, with hanging out with my friends in the open water uh, uh, in Lake Ontario and uh, in fact, all the great, uh, great lakes. Um, I've also done a few things on the land. I've done a few marathons and I survived uh, Marathon de Sable, which is a seven day, uh, six stage race in the Sahara Desert. Um, I, in fact, I barely crossed across the finish line. And uh, right now, actually, I'm training for a hundred mile run, uh, which, uh, which got canceled and it's being postponed to next year. Uh, so the interesting thing about this 100-mile run is uh, there's a 7,000-meter elevation gain, and this happens in uh, the beautiful uh, Rocky Mountains. And uh, I have a wonderful family. I have a beautiful wife who is smarter than me and two wonderful kids. And uh, is, is, is the 100-mile race called the Hard, Cas Hard Castle 100 or Hard Case 100? There's a no, famous race down there. It is called Sinister Seven. <laughs> Sinister Seven. <laughs> Why not? So, in fact, another, uh, uh, like, I mean, yeah, you've, uh, uh, the seven is because you're climbing seven peaks. It's 100 miles. Uh, in fact, uh, like, something that was very uh, uh, catchy with this uh, race was, once you finish the race, you get to be called a sinner. How cool is okay. that? But, but that was not my motivation. My motivation was I have, uh, you know, I hang out with a bunch of people and uh, three of my friends actually went to do the race last year and only one of them finished just because of, uh, I mean, the degree of difficulty, the tricky things that go through 100 miles. And also these guys are wonderful people. And I thought, hey, I want to hang out with them. Like, uh, like you, you're in pain. And we're still laughing. So that's that unique experience of uh, pushing the boundaries and still uh, keeping our humor intact. So that's, uh, that, that's, the, that's the experience that I wanted to re relive, yeah. <laughs> One of our guests in a few days will be Kent Nicholas from uh, SCAR. And mm -hmm. the, the experience of being together for four days of SCAR is one of um, joint pain as well. Maju, talk us, talk us through um, the comparison between Straits of Magellan, the English Channel, Lake Ontario, and the, and the Desert Run. G give us some differences and similarities be between the, the training, the actual experience of these, of these events. Um, I'm not sure if you guys, uh, um, or you might partly agree with me on this. What I have noticed is uh, um, like when it comes to these swims, I don't think I can compare them. They all have their unique uh, uh, traits of uh, weirdness or degrees of difficulties and uh, unique uh, 
monsters that live uh, within uh, each of them. Uh, but some, a common factor that I have noticed is uh, it's the kind of people that congregate to, to take up these challenges are the same. Uh, and, but another thing is it's the training. That is also another common factor. What I've learned is, uh, I learned this uh, when I was training for the channel, or at least when I, uh, almost, I think when I got across the swimming channel, what I noticed was uh, training is actually very critical. And I made sure, and the people around me, people at South End Rowing Club, made sure that my training was actually much uh, harder than the swim itself. Uh, with the experience uh, that was in the club, at South End Rowing Club, they said, okay, hey, Madhu, tomorrow there's a storm coming in. Let's go in and swim. So every training, every swim that I went in, I was literally crying. Guys, what are you guys doing this to me? Why are you guys doing this to me? I, like Bob Roper and John Mayer, who took me out uh, on a Zodiac, I literally cried. Yeah, there were, there were times I, I was like scared. Uh, but that experience actually made me survive or made my swim across uh, the English Channel uneventful. So I reach a stage when I get to the starting line, I make sure that, okay, that I've gone through all the, uh, all the critical attributes that I have learned about SWIM. Um, even if I don't have uh, itemized it, I make sure that the people uh, or the team that supports me uh, have understood that. Uh, so my SWIM becomes uneventful. But yet, when you get in, there is always uh, unknown uncertainties that uh, play a, a significant role in these adventures. So I think one common factor is uh, all these uh, adventures are like expeditions and uh, you need to be uh, sure that, okay, there is something that will happen which can't be controlled. So you need to be prepared for that. Uh, it, is, that is it, is, it is one of the things in the sport that people talk about, um, you know, they've done their six hour qualifying swim for the English channel and now they're ready. And I think people in the sport go, no, 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 no. That's a, that's, that's maybe the first six hours of your swim. Um, there might be another six hours and another six hours after that. So that's, that's only one element of training. And you're talking yes. about uh, yes. uh, you're some right. of the older, the older guys giving you the, uh, the, the benefit of their wisdom. Yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, so when I was training for the channel, I think uh, every swim I did before I went to the channel, I failed. That's, uh, uh, that is something that I actually, when I think about my, in fact, a big chunk of my memory from the channel is, uh, is all about my training swim. Uh, I have like uh, geographical references in San Francisco. But hey, this is where that happened. Like I was stuck in this corner in that oyster point where I was like, I, I literally cried. And then we were at, uh, um, I think one of the uh, big uh, Navy ships, US Navy ships actually uh, crossed our path uh, like at Pier 1. So these are the memories that I have. And uh, yeah, so and you're absolutely right. Yeah, the swim, uh, the swim ends only when you get back to, uh, when you touch the shore and you get back to the boat. That's, that's what I've, uh, that's what I realized. And I'm glad everything, uh, for me, it was an uneventful uh, day in the channel. And, and that's how I want all my uh, adventures to be. How did you come about going down to the Straits of Magellan? How did this happen? Uh, it's not exactly around the corner from where you live. That's true, actually. Yeah, so Straits of Magellan, yeah. I learned about uh, Ferdinand Magellan when I was in grade five, I still have a, 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 a pictorial memory of uh, reading uh, uh, Magellan's name in the textbook that I was, uh, um, I was going through. Um, and also it made a reference to uh, uh, the magnetic compasses that were made by a, like a company called Magellan. So those were the two memories that I had as a kid. Uh, and then I, like as you grow up, curiosity and like we were, uh, we lived in a, a, a beautiful city in India called Mysore, which is a uh, which is known for its university. 
I lived in the university quarter, so we had access to libraries. Uh, so uh, like, I mean, all kinds of uh, literary contents and everything. So it gave me access to um, all the encyclopedias. I think those things are outdated now. Yeah, we have Google, we have internet, and the content is much easier and uh, is cheaper right now. So I, 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 I learned about uh, Magellan being the first person to have uh, um, done the, uh, I mean, in, in fact, as I have learned more about it, he could not finish uh, uh, like the circumnavigation. But however, he was the first person to come come up with that idea and at least uh, uh, make it happen. So uh, a big chunk of my uh, reference goes to the early explorers. And then I met uh, Lynn Cox in 2003 when I was trading for the channel and we lived in uh, uh, San Francisco. So uh, I learned about uh, Straits of Magellan, but it was in, in my background, yeah. I mean, these things are lit ridiculously expensive. These things, you can't just uh, like uh, pull out of your back pocket and say, hey, I'm gonna go do this. So that's, that's, that's where that, that seed thought came into my head. Uh, and as, uh, as life progresses and as you evolve uh, from adventures and as you progress with uh, uh, in your like in, as in your family, you okay? You set a uh, you. I, I reached a place. Okay, hey, I think this is something that I need to uh, try. So my first attempt was uh, in January of 2015, and I was in the Straits of uh, in the Straits for about two hours. I had traveled uh, 9.8 kilometers, um, so I did not make it. But it was a fantastic experience. The people that came together, I had a lot of fun uh, in Chile, the Chilean Navy, uh, the Canadian consulate, we had a lot of fun. And then I came back and I had to deal with the, uh, the monsters that I had uh, met in the, uh, in the Straits of Magellan. I uh, again seek and built another group of people, strong team who helped me get over my fears. And then I worked back into getting back to the starting line. But again, I wasn't, uh, I mean, like, I mean, yeah, all the training that we do still did not give me a ticket to get across the, uh, the Straits of uh, Magellan. I literally had to fight the demon every stroke because I was, uh, I was scared that I was going to die. What, what were the demons? Uh, the demon was that uh, I'm, I'm, I didn't want to be, I wanted to be part of my family, my kids growing up. So I didn't want to die in the Straits. That was my fear. And every stroke that I took, I thought, okay, the next stroke I'm going to die. Next, so I had to literally. And, and, and was it because it was cold? It was rough. The sea snakes were on your feet. What what were the what were the real causes of your of your demons? The real causes was actually my uh, attempt from 2015, where I was stuck in the states of Magellan for one hour and 55 minutes. So when I got on the navy ship, I had passed out for uh, for about 20 minutes. So I don't recollect, I mean, I did not pass up. I don't recollect uh, the 20 minutes uh, of what happened to me since I got on the uh, ship. So that was my fear. And also like when you're in the Straits, it's not a, uh, like, I mean, yeah, when I compare to, as I said, yeah, none of these swims can be compared. Uh, like some of my experience, uh, like, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of, uh, like, I mean, as I mentioned, yeah, like Bob Roper and John Mayer have taken me out in some uh, rough conditions. But uh, Streets of Magellan has this micro weather system called Viliva, where things change rapidly. Within a matter of 20 minutes, uh, like the weather systems can change. And a normal condition is uh, anywhere from 30 to 50 knots of wind speed. And the narrows of the Straits, it flows like a river. And on top of it, you bring this uh, weather systems uh, into the picture. So I'm sure you can, uh, you can interpret it as to what you're going through. So, so it's, it, it sounds a bit like Steve Munitone is talking about the Straits of Cigarro. So if I, would, if I would say Lake Ontario is often very friendly, the English Channel's not very friendly, but the Straits of Magellan are downright nasty. Yes, yeah, you could say that, yeah. <laughs> but let me bring you to um, Ontario. Your, um, 
you're a swimmer, you're an organizer, you're a historian. Um, we, we met a young lady uh, many years ago named Annalise Carr. And I think yes. you were probably involved with, with her, her swim. Uh, describe to us uh, who she was, what age she was, the fact that she's uh, certainly no more than five feet tall. Uh, and, uh, it, it describe how all that came together and, and the enjoyment you get from being part of an adventure like that for a young woman. Uh, the funny thing about uh, like uh, about Annalise Carr uh, was uh, we both swam across the lake in the same year, 2012. So um, I think I swam across uh, on July 30th, and she swam uh, third week of August. Uh, so I would go to work and uh, like we were in some uh, tricky meeting and somebody would mention, hey, this guy swam across the lake. And immediately some of my sm smart friends who were in the room, that's not a big deal. A 30 year old swam across the lake last week. <laughs> 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 so yeah, Annalise is, uh, uh, is a fantastic swimmer. Yeah. Uh, so was I involved? I think I... Uh, I don't think I was like deeply involved uh, in her, uh, in a team, but uh, we did a few swims together. Uh, that's where actually we exchanged, uh, uh, where I think, uh, I think one thing that I shared, I might not be, uh, it might not be a, a, a true, but this is, this is my memory, yeah. Uh, I think we spoke about mind over matter. Uh, and then uh, we, we just uh, had a good, uh, good, solid, positive connection, and uh, okay. yeah, that's 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 my uh, that was my biggest contribution to her swim. I I don't think I yeah I was part of. I don't think I helped her in terms of setting up the logistics or anything because I'm um, I mean I, when I build my team, it's very lightweight and uh, uh, it's low profile, so um, yeah. I was, but, but we, we, I think we did about 10 or 15 swims where we, yeah, like we swam stroke to stroke. Yeah, just being out in the water and just being, uh, uh, yeah, just feeling, feeling the energy. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I would, uh, that, that, that's my biggest experience swimming with uh, Annalise Park. Yeah. I had a young protege years ago. He was uh, 15 and he was going to go for the English Channel the next year. And he had never failed at anything in his life. He was the best student. He was the nicest guy. He was a good son. It was, it was all those things. So I contacted uh, Nick Adams in the UK, who famously swam the channel at 16 and uh, has taken a number of young swimmers across since. And I said, Nick, I said, should I make him fail a few times? Should I you know, bring him out on swims and, and make sure he fails? Because he's never failed at anything and he probably doesn't know what it's like. And when you get to a certain age, you failed at lots of things. You know, the, yes. the girl wouldn't dance with you when you were 16. You didn't get the job you wanted. You got a car crash, you divorced, you know, whatever it might be. There's, there's plenty of failures. And, and Nick's advice to me always stuck with me. He said, no, he goes, um, the kid thinks he's indestructible. He said, that's his biggest strength. He said, your job is to keep him safe. And it, and it was interesting that um, as you talk about the monsters you had, and, and people like uh, Annalise at 13 and, and young Owen uh, uh, at, at 16, they didn't seem to have any fears. Fears, um, exactly. Yeah. They, they, had, they had never had a problem that they couldn't get over. Uh, nothing bad had ever gone wrong in their lives. And they just, uh, yeah, it's just fine. They're going to go for a swim now. Yeah. It's interesting. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, uh, I kind of agree with Nick's. Uh, that's what I see in my, uh, my kids as well. Yeah because they have absolutely no fear. And in fact, I've gotten over a lot of my fears through them. Okay. So I did not instill my fear, but I took a step back and said, hey, maybe I can work with them to get over my fear. It's, uh, it's actually, a, yeah, that's, that's my experience. I mean, I, I have a lot of fears, but I've gotten out of <laughs> some of the fears uh, through my, my kids. And now you're also involved uh, locally in, um, in the whole organization of the swimming, including the cold swimming in Lake Ontario. T tell us about how you go and organize a cold water swim, what kind of safety measures you put in place. And while you do that, I don't want to distract you, but I'm just going to 
I just got to put it on my ice swimming jacket to possibly inspire you for later. <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> uh, uh, in fact, my biggest strength is, uh, in, uh, like, I mean, uh, anything that I do, I make sure that the people who come to support have the right attitude. attitude. People who are not scared to take on an adventure, people, people who are not uh, uh, afraid to operate, uh, af afraid at, at, the, at the threshold of a barrier, like people who are not afraid to push the barrier. So rather than equipment, I focus on attitude. I, I'm not worried that, okay, uh, that we don't have an EMS uh, uh, with us, but it is the right set of people that can actually uh, help us be safe. I think that is an important factor in uh, open water swimming. It's not the equipment, it's not the, the sassiest and the, uh, the coolest technology that you need. So that is one approach I, I always look for. And people need to be committed to support the individual. So when I am out there to help somebody, um, I am 100% committed. Because any, if anything goes wrong, okay, we know what to do. Or even if we don't know what to do, we will figure out a way with whatever we have to get out of the situation and make, this, uh, make the uh, swim safe and keep the swimmer safe. Uh, and that's how I look at things. Uh, not everybody agrees with me, but that's, that's what I believe in, actually. Even when I take the same approach at work as well, it is not the skills that we need to solve a problem. It is the right attitude that we need. Uh, you can always acquire skills if you have the right attitude. So, so give, me an, give me an example. This, uh, this last weekend, did you have a group swimming in the, in, in the lake? No, we have been actually yeah, heeding to the advice of public health uh, uh, these okay. days, which is very important. I think uh, like with what we are going through right now, I think we have to make sure we don't burden uh, the healthcare systems. Uh, well, let's, let, me, let me bring you back to December or November. Describe, describe a, a, a swim in the lake. How many people show up? How many people are swimming? How many people are supporting? What kind of donuts and cakes you have afterwards? <laughs> uh, so as I said, it's, it's a it's a congregation or a fellowship of uh, these unique characters uh, who are committed to uh, be, um, be part of uh, the sunrise. That's, that's something that I, I started, uh, 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 or that's something that I picked up from Southern Rowing Club. So when I was training for uh, uh, the English Channel, uh, like something that, uh, that kind of actually kept me going was, uh, uh, the craziest group of people in Southern Growing Club would meet at, would meet at dawn and go for a swim. Sunrise is always beautiful, but these characters, these guys were the craziest of the craziest in Southern Growing Club. So being, being with them and like, okay, doing things that, uh, uh, that we never planned to do. We would go show up at the club and then we would, uh, do something uh, which I was uh, was never planning to do. So, and then laugh about it and go back to our realities, which is uh, work life and family life, uh, which, are, which, which is more important, right? But we had fun. Like, uh, so I make sure that the same kind of personalities are the same group of people uh, meet at uh, Coronation Park which is like a small cove uh, near my house. And we have uh, named that as Glow Beach. Uh, Great Lakes uh, Open Water uh, Adventures is the, uh, is the group that uh, uh, I have co-founded along with uh, six other people. Uh, so where we help uh, other uh, crazies to uh, reach their, uh, their, achieve their dreams. So, so, so you, have, you have a known location that's relatively sheltered Yes. Um, and, and how many people are showing up at, at one of your swims? Is it 10 people, 20 people, 50 people? Uh, it can be anywhere from 3 to 25, 50. And at times we have had uh, 100 people. So 
when the crowd becomes bigger, we make sure, okay, that uh, the support system, uh, I, I, I will sacrifice my swim and I make sure, okay, I'm on the beach to uh, oversee uh, and make sure the swim is safe. Okay. And the only uh, fee that we, uh, or uh, the only contribution to this whole uh, swim that was organized was make, keeping the beach clean. All we ask for uh, people who come swim with us is like, okay, spend two minutes in uh, uh, clearing the plastics on the beach. That's about it, yeah. Which is actually, uh, I mean, I, I get a massive thrill when I, uh, when I uh, get a big pile of plastic. So, and then we make sure, okay, we put it in the garbage or whatever we need to do. And uh, lately, I'm sorry, I'm gonna diverge a little bit a little bit here because we've also uh, working with Swim Drink Fish Canada, which is an organization uh, that uh, uh, me, Lauren King, Mauro Campanelli, we're all associated with. And uh, me and Lauren are the ambassadors of uh, Swim Drink Fish Canada. So we have built a, a AI tool. And what we have been doing is uh, uh, we are training the software to recognize the kind of plastic that uh, we find. So yeah, so yeah, I mean, there's a bigger, uh, bigger purpose behind that. Yeah, so that's that's a small achievement that uh, the technology side. Uh, uh, and and for, and for your swims, is is there a set course? Is there a time limit? Are there a set of boys? Is it go to that point, that point, and back? How do you how do you, how do you keep all of the kittens safe that are out there uh, trying to swim? Thanks for keeping me focused, uh, Ned. <laughs> so Cove has actually, yeah, there is a buoy out there which uh, we uh, we call, it's it's like a leprechaun. And depending on what's happening in the lake, you can't see the buoy or you can't see the buoy. So the biggest thrill for us is to, which is about 750 meters out in the lake. So we go touch the buoy and then we come back. Depending on uh, uh, the experience that we get, we give a title to the surf. Sometimes it's a drunken buoy because uh, we take a can of beer to the buoy and then like six or 10 of people, people we take a sip and then we come back. I mean, sometimes we take a, a, a flask of coffee and then we have a cup of coffee at the buoy. So silly things like this, okay? But, and then also this uh, Coronation Park is a nice cove. We have called this as the Glow Triangle. It's a five kilometer swim. This is where, I mean, as swimmers get stronger, uh, so we have different uh, uh, groups of uh, swimmers, people, in fact, uh, uh, people who have never swum, uh, who have never gotten into uh, uh, Lake Ontario, who are living by the shores of Lake Ontario, have actually started joining us, just uh, watching us. So uh, we have a group that stays close to the shore, on, like uh, uh, there's a nice sandbar, so people just stop. Uh, some people have started walking and they've slowly started learning to swim, which is actually, uh, 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 I think that's, that's the coolest achievement that we have uh, we've done because we've, uh, people who have been living by the, by the shores of Great Lake for the past 40, 50 years have started embracing and touching the lake. That's one nice thing. So we have a group where people are learning to swim, so we make sure they're safe. And then uh, a bunch of us will go to the buoy. And then we, again, we, swim, we always swim in parts to make sure, okay, every uh, swimmer uh, is safe. Um, and then uh, once a week, we do the five kilometer swim, depending on how much time we have, yeah. So it's a careful balance between what the reality and uh, our, uh, our passion. Well, we've, we've reached the end of our time, Madhu. So I, I wanna thank you for being a swim organizer. I want to thank you for bringing more people into sport, keeping them safe, and I wish you all the best at 7,000, uh, is that meters or feet? I think it's feet above sea level. 7,000 meters. Meters. Remember, bring your own air with you because there'll be no yes. air there. So, so thank you very much and, and all the best. Cheers. Thanks, Ned Take and care. Steve. Yeah, and uh, congratulations. And you guys uh, are doing, like, like, you guys are doing some wonderful things. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you very Thank much. You.